Hello, and welcome to Civics. I'm Michael Shea, the host of this episode of Civics. On Civics, we meet activists and volunteers who've been involved in a variety of activities in their community. We like to think that you'll be informed by this program, but also inspired. Today, we're joined by Joan Mulholland, who is a longtime Arlington resident and, in the 1960s, was active in the Civil Rights Movement. Joan, thanks very much for coming on Civics. Thank you for having me. So you, you grew up in Arlington uh, back at a time when Arlington was very different than, from today. What was it like growing up in Arlington? Arlington was, my world was totally white. There was also a black Arlington and never the twain met at least beyond the housekeeper and yard man basis. I was fortunate enough to live in a community of Buckingham which was known to be the only place that would rent to Jews. And so many, many of my playmates in the neighborhood were Jewish, which I think had its influence. Mm -hmm. But um, it was the South. Yes. Robert E. Lee's hometown, and we stood in school to sing Dixie. Right. But you uh, got a little bit of different experience or a different, some different ideas, maybe, by some of the churches you were attending. Yes, I went to a Presbyterian church, and we had to memorize Bible verses and get a gold star in our Bibles if we could do them. You know, like, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Things like that, and I took it rather literally. And um, we were hypocrites. So as you got into high school, you began to think that what you were learning in church or, or sort of believing was not matching up with what you were living. It definitely wasn't. And also we back then had to memorize the Declaration of Independence. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident, etc. And we um, weren't doing that either. Plus we had massive resistance in the... Um, and in high school, one of my classmates next to me in Spanish class was a year behind. Now this was an all-white school. Mm -hmm. She had missed a year of school because the schools were closed under court-ordered integration and boom, that was it. And that could happen to us. So it got you thinking about it. Mm -hmm. This was the late 1950s? This was the late 50s. Late 50s. About probably 57, 58. Okay. And uh, your reference to the Declaration of Independence um, what always strikes me about American history is we've, we've made progress because we've let our words run ahead of our actions. And we've, we've, the actions have been to force us to live up to those words. I think that's been one of the things we've, that's helped us as a country. Um, so you were then going to college, and you went down to, to Duke University? Well, I went to Duke. That was my mother's idea. Right. I wanted to go to a small church school in, I think, Ohio, and my mother, was a, who was from the Deep South and a product of her environment, mm -hmm. um, she was afraid it would be integrated, and I might be in the same classroom with colored, as the polite term was mm -hmm. then, and I should go to Duke, which was well-known and safely segregated in the South, and that was Mama's big mistake. What did you find when you, when you got to Duke? Well, it was a huge place mm -hmm. centered around the Greek organizations and, um, of course, all white, except for there were folks from India who were darker than anyone else. And that, that struck me, too. Mm -hmm. And um, then the sit-ins started in Greensboro, and the second place for sit-ins was Durham, where Duke was, and... After a couple months of that, our chaplain told us at um, our Sunday evening meeting that there would be some of the students who are leading the sit-ins come next week and keep it quiet. Uh, could the administration could lock the building, the rowdies could show up, and, or the police could arrest us, which was exactly the same thing that we'd heard back in Arlington when we had a similar meeting. And... Um, so anyway, these well-dressed students came and explained the legal and moral basis of, uh, the, for the sit-ins and invited us to join them. So some of us did. So you were attending uh, that church service not 
specifically to get involved in a social justice campaign, but you were just because you were practicing your faith. Yes, and I went every in. Sunday. Yeah. Right, right. So what happened next? Where did you uh, join the sit-in movement in, in Durham? We, my roommate, who's from New York, and I and some of those good-looking graduate guys uh, went and joined on the picket lines with these students from North Carolina College, and then when they had a sit-in, we sat in with them and promptly ended up in jail. So just to give people that maybe don't know the history some context, the lunch counters or the restaurant, it was lunch counters. It was lunch counters, was lunch counters, dime store lunch counters. That were segregated, if not by law, certainly by the white establishment. And the picketing would occur there would be picketing outside the stores on the sidewalk, main streets of right. town, saying, you know, don't buy where you can't eat or right. um, target democracy and things right. like that. And, uh, and then at a planned time, certain people would go in and sit at the lunch counter, violate the rules, but to make the statement that it was wrong. Yes, and be refused service, and then the police would come in and arrest you for... Um, trespass usually, with or without the being invited by the store manager. So did you get arrested at that time? Yes, Okay. Twice. And, and what, what was that like? What, what happened when you got arrested? Well, of course, the jails were all segregated too. And so you were just thrown in with the regular prisoners, which if you were white was not really comfortable. Um, we got bailed out, everyone did. Um, but it was a little rougher for apprehension at least, uh, if not actual violence for the white sit-ins. And then it got appealed through the courts up to the Supreme Court of the United States where it was overturned. Now, you knew you were probably going to be arrested. Oh, yeah. It was something, a lot of the experience was something that you've been prepared for or you, or you were aware of, certainly. Yes. Um, so what hap what, how long did that go on in Durham? Um, and was this... Your, your, your freshman year in college. Freshman year in college, and this would have been, I'm not sure, but in the spring, maybe April, May, and then Duke and I party company at the end of this semester. Was that a mutual decision? Were you asked to leave? They, were, they would have expelled us, except that the university professor's organization intervened and kept it from that. And actually, I told one professor, um, now, I might be in jail, and if you give a quiz, can I make it up later? And he smiled and laughed and said, no, I'll just bring it down to the jail cell. You can't cheat there. But he was, you know, that was a good support. Yeah. And, um, but the school administration was, was on our case, and I, I didn't need that, so I quit. But you had enough people at Duke to feel supported. You, you had enough of a supportive environment. There was a good. Did not feel totally. Yeah, honest. and there were, there weren't that many who were actually, part of the joining with the movement. But on the halls in the dormitory, you had girls slipping us dollars and saying, you know, I would do it, but my parents' job and this and that. And, but there were enough who supported you. Now there were those who didn't support you and made no bones about it. But, it wasn't that uncomfortable. Okay, and then what was your? What did you do next? I mean, you you. You, had to, you were still, actually didn't have your college Came degree yet. Came back up so to you, Washington, got a, a job. Yeah. And um, the folks in North Carolina, the NCC students, had said, well, we haven't heard anything from Howard since the big formative meeting for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Go up to Howard and see what's happening and let us know. And if nothing's happening, get them moving. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that at Howard, which I had to find how to get there and all, but there was a group planning sit-ins like the next day from when I met them in Arlington. Well, here I was the one with the you know, sit-in jail experience and I was from Arlington, knew my way around, so quickly we were sitting in in Arlington. And do you remember the place you sat in? Are um, still here? There was People's and Drug Fair in Cherrydale. Now, the People's is now CVS, and Drug Fair got torn down, and um, there's a big Safeway. All right, all right. But the problem 
the biggest problem we had was the um, American Nazi Party was headquartered in Arlington, and they showed up and counter-picketed -pick right behind us and were in our face and rallying students down at WNL to come up and hassle us. But it was cool, and I really think the owners of these small chains of drugstores um, were just waiting to have their hand forced. It was, the state law required them to be segregated, mm -hmm. but I think they were just waiting to say, oh, we have to break the law. Mm -hmm. And within two weeks, Arlington County's eateries were integrated. And then what's next? What You ended up going to Mississippi, though. Well, next was actually Glen Echo. I mean, what are you going to do? Arlington was integrated in two weeks, and the summer is just beginning. Well, let's go to the beach. But realistically, commuting to the beach was not practical. Right. So we went up to Glen Echo Amusement Park and picketed all summer. And there being white, I could go in and buy tickets for the rides and come back out and give them to um, the Howard students. and joined the picket lines, and meanwhile I was still working. And when that ended, then the Freedom Rides got started. I had decided, though, that I wanted to go back to college. And the pictures of Charlene Hunter, now Charlene Hunter Galt, um, being run off the campus clutching her Madonna down in Georgia, that spoke to me. And I felt that the integration of the colleges should not be a one-way street with the blacks bearing the burden that um, I should reach out and apply to historically black colleges. And if I were accepted, great. I could understand if I wasn't with the riots that were going on. But Tougaloo College in Mississippi accepted me. Um, their charter was older than the state segregation laws. They were like grandfathered. And their money came from the North. So they felt comfortable accepting a white student. And before I, the semester started, the Freedom Rides came along, and Hank Thomas, whose picture by the burning bus is well known, was part of our DC group. And so, following Gandhi, when one falls, others ste step up and take their place. And so, the group in Washington started going down, and I went and rode the train with Stokely Carmichael. That was a trip into Jackson from New Orleans. and. Um, and you were, but you were also a student there at the time. Now, I wasn't a student oh, oh. yet. This was in the summertime. Oh, this was the summer. Okay, right. And school didn't start till September. Okay. So once I got arrested in the Freedom Rides, and it became a jail-in situation. Mm -hmm. uh, long story there, we'll skip it, but we were staying in jail as long as we could. And I had only a two-month, $200 sentence. And so I could stay my two months albeit at Parchman Penitentiary, and $3 a day against the $200 fine and get out just in time to go to campus. <laughs> you know, free room and board, compliments of the great and sovereign state of Mississippi. <laughs> what was, I guess I would have two questions. What did you think it would be like being in a penitentiary, and what, what did it end up being like? Well, we didn't know when we were first arrested um, that we would be going there. We were in the county jail which was so crowded, in mean, the white woman's cell anyway, and filthy and all of that, that and they were going to send us to parchment because we were overflowed. We were down to less than three square feet of floor space per person. Mm. And um, parchment was right notorious as the worst prison in the country, you know, right up there with Angola and Louisiana and stuff of legends. And so we expected the worst, but the worst part was being cut off from any means of communication that was not out of the control of them. You know, you couldn't scream bloody murder and be heard on the main street of town like you could in Jackson. Actually, it was cleaner and more comfortable, and the food was better. So physically, it was an improvement. Psychologically, it was bad. Yeah for the women. Do you think to some extent it was um, cleaner and the food was better and all that, that some of the conditions were better because the inmates had were somewhat organized or do you think that the, the state was running a better 
I think the state was running a better thing, and they did empty out death row to put us there. My cell was the last one before the gas chamber. But um, it was a newer, cleaner facility. Okay, okay. So two months there. Two months. And um, but then I have a hunch you didn't, you stayed involved. You became, you became a student again, but yeah. you were still getting active in the... I was still active. Um, first and foremost, a student, mm -hmm. but as whatever was happening, um, the students were involved in. Um, I guess at first, economic boycotts. Mm -hmm. um, there was, I, as a white woman, I couldn't be out with the um, field workers in the Delta or anything, aside from being a student, but I was down at the Joint Corps, which had done the Freedom Rides, mm -hmm. SNCC, the student activist. They shared an office just down the street from Medgar Evers NAACP office, and I was good at office work. So I did that and stayed out of sight for the most part. Okay. And so we finished up there. I could go down to Medgar Evers' office. And so a lot of office papery work right. back when you had the old crank mimeograph machines and all. Oh, I remember those. Yes. And um, then for the March on Washington, I was up working in their office that summer in Washington, D.C. And just whatever was happening, to the extent that it was productive for me to be part of it, not endangering people, I was there. Right. Through this time, to what extent did you feel ready for the sit-in, ready for, or did you, did you, did you go into these things, or, or for the penitentiary, did you go into these things feeling very uncertain about your ability to, to cope with it, or... Because you were still, you're still very young at this point. Yeah, I was, you know, 19 or so. Yeah. No, um, I didn't feel apprehensive or anything. Mm -hmm. um, well, for one thing, you didn't know what was going to happen. You didn't know what you had to be ready for. That's a good point. And um, once you're committed, the worst they can do is kill you. So, you know, once you accept the worst that can yeah. happen, the rest is less. That's true, but that's an awful lot to accept. And I have found, like in the Jackson sit-in, that it's like I'm there, but my real me, my essence of me, my soul, my spirit, my whatever, has sort of left me and is like a guardian angel mm -hmm. watching out for me. And it's just this shell sitting at the lunch counter or whatever mm -hmm. is happening. So um, there's a song, You Can Kill My Body But Not My Soul. Mm -hmm. I think that sort of captures it. Mm. Fear is counterproductive. You can't yeah. think clearly. You can't deal right, with the situation right, right. if you're all wrapped up in fear. Right. But some fear maybe sometimes can motivate you to be alert and, you know, yeah. to, to think. I mean, you need to be aware. You need to be aware. You need to be aware. Um, when you, did you feel like, well, you felt like there was a victory in Arlington. Oh, a victory when, yes. the, when, the, when the counters were integrated. Yes. But in general, did you feel at the time that as a society we were making definite steps forward or did it seem more like a struggle and there's so much more to go? How did you, how did you think of it at the time? I think we were just in the moment of mm -hmm. the lunch counters are integrated. Now what? Right. We didn't, at least... I didn't think on a big picture. We needed, knew things needed to change, but one step right. at a time, and the walls would come crumbling down. Right. So what then, you, you did finish your degree. I did. Um, in Mississippi. In Mississippi. And then did you move back, you moved back to the Washington, D.C. area. What, what did you engage in then, or what did you, what was your life like then? Um, I'd gone to Mississippi as a student, and I left when I was through, sit-ins and church visits and everything behind me. I had to find a job, um, mm -hmm. ended up working at the Smithsonian in cultural history. Um, moved on to working in the schools and marriage and family. But wherever I went, whatever I was doing, I took the experience and knowledge with me. Mm -hmm. At the Smithsonian at that time, they had nothing related to the black history. Mm -hmm. Um, much less the civil rights movement. 
And I remember the head of the department asking me, the lowest clerk, the GS2, what would be good representative things to have to, for the black experience? Mm -hmm. You know, here I am, this, what, 21-year-old or whatever white girl I'm supposed to know. <laughs> but um, I did end up um, bringing up the Gullah people in South Carolina uh -huh. and was able to get some picket signs from Durham. Uh -huh. um, I knew where they were stored, and I've seen them on display there, and get a few things donated, some cards we've made out of, deck of cards out of um, envelopes in parchment. That's so for in, the, the, the deck of cards were for um, during the protests, or? Yeah, playing solitaire at parchment. Okay. But, um, you know, got a few things, and then moved on. Um, through normal life, but always taking this with me. Right. And you've been able to meet with students and talk to students and, and share your experiences. Yes. And in the classroom, just have a different approach, I think, to things, a more mm -hmm. inclusive. Right. Oh, I had one teacher, it was funny, um, a few years ago. He was teaching under these standards of learning. Right. And um, the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves, and I was in the back room, and we had it like a dog and pony show. Yes, Ms. Mulholland. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation only freed the slaves in areas in rebellion against the U.S. where the federal government had no power. How did that free the... It <laughs> Ms. Mulholland is right. It did not... <laughs> But if you see it on a test, the answer is. <laughs> but otherwise, I think most teachers just taught this point blank. Is um, right, right. If we found certain discrepancies in the Virginia fourth grade social studies books, I think. I, I do have some mm -hmm. moments with my son, and maybe not even just as directly a contradiction as that, of what they're being taught, but mm -hmm. just as, a, as an additional nuance. But then I'll have to pull back and say, no, but wait. You have a test tomorrow. The thing to remember is what's going to be on the test. Yeah. You know, but um, so you, you went down there as a student. How, how did your family, I'm, I'm just curious, how did your family react, friends you had when you were growing up in Arlington? How did your relationship with them change because of your experiences in, in Mississippi? Basically, my friends from growing up, um, I have lost contact with. Mm. I think often when you go from high school to to college, and this being such a transient area, you lose contact. Mm. My family was horrified. Mm. My father was from southwest Iowa, and I think he basically supported the goals of the movement without question, but as a government bureaucrat felt you work to change the laws and from the top down. Um, plus, he's probably afraid I'd get killed. Right. Um, my mother, um, from the very rural deep south, um, was a segregationist, mm -hmm. and I was pretty close to disowned. Mm -hmm. Not as close as you can be without being disowned. And she thought I'd been brainwashed or something and trying to change me, but cut off all financial aid, you know. Yeah. Did you, in later years, um, did the relationship improve in later years? Or? Grandchildren helps a lot of relationships. Right. Yes. But until the end, my mother was an unrepentant segregationist. Um, so what do you think, I, oh I guess, I guess I, at the time, as you, as you noted, you, you, you didn't have a set, you took it one step at a time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a sense of here's something we need to accomplish, okay now we're done with. Have there been times since then though when you have felt a lot of completeness or Significant progress? Are, are there been moments since then that it, it's well, felt Virginia the gave the presidency to Obama okay. the first time. Okay. And a second time. And a second time, but right. it was like we did it. Right. We weren't trying to elect a black president. Right. But that was proof that our movement had right. had had done right. a lot. But at the same time, while everyone was cheering. My, I was just sort of caught up, not in the cheering, but I felt I had to take my Obama button 
to Medgar Evers' grave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I did that, sort of like my, giving my report to Medgar, we did it. Right. You did not die in vain. Right. That I felt, well, not quite euphoric, but I felt the, the wholeness of it. The wholeness of it, that's what I said, complete. You've been complete. Yes, I think that's, that's a very good point. Um, so what do you see as our continuing challenges and some of the big challenges? Because I think for someone in 1961 going to college, um, it was pretty easy to see the big challenges. What, what should people see now? What should young people see now, do you think, as the big challenges? We still don't accept each other mm -hmm. as just another person. We have this whole thing about immigration and papers and religion, you know. Is he a Muslim? Can you trust him? He might be a terrorist. I might look at the Crusaders if you want terrorists. <laughs> and papers, I don't know about your ancestors, but mine sure didn't come here under the best of circumstances. Yeah, In yeah. the old country, and yeah, maybe the papers weren't quite as in order as at Ellis Island as one would have liked, but we're basically people, right. and we need to, to get there. Um, so, do you have a lot of hope through life? Has that been, would you say that's been a characteristic of you, that you're a very a, a hopeful person? Because you, you know, you were taking it one step at a time 50, 50 years ago or so, but you were facing big challenges. We're still facing big yeah. challenges. So do you think you're a hopeful person? Would you? Oh. <laughs> I don't know that hope is the word, but we can't look back. Right. We have to go forward. Right. We have to have faith. I think faith is a better word than hope. Okay. The evidence of things hoped for. Right. Right. No, that's 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 a good distinction. I think that's good. Um, and so, what you continue to talk to people in the schools? Yes. Do you have any any? Um, if you were going to give them, if you were going to give, not a graduation speech, if you were going to give a first day of school speech to students, what would be your, what would be your message? What would be, your, what would be the sum of your message to them? I know I, know, I, know I didn't, I, wow. we talked before the program, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I, that just occurred to me that I would, see, see you are someone that I would want to speak to students, maybe at the graduation, but they get a lot for that. But I wanted you to speak to the students the, the first, first day. day. Because I'd want you to be able to talk to them then and say, what, 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 what words would you give them? We're all here together. Right. We all have something important to contribute. We won't approach it all the same. Right. But we've got to learn from each other. Right. Right. And let's go forward. Right. I think that's very good. I hope the students today hear that message. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the program. I want to thank... Our entire volunteer crew at, our, at Arlington Independent Media, they've been great in helping us produce this program. But most of all, I want to thank Joan Mulholland for working so hard for so long to make her community a better place to live. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.